morning or for tuning in. Uh, this has been so good. You know, I, I stand up here and I'm speaking on the law. And I've got multiple lawyers here on the front row. I've got Sharon Hemphill right in front of me. I've got <laughs> Mel Cockrell right here. And so this is like one where you've always got to be a little bit careful because you've got you know, the teacher grading your paper just right there looking at you. And uh, uh, I appreciate you guys for being here. Uh, I also want to say that I appreciate you because a number of you, uh-oh, this is not working. And if this doesn't work, it will not be a long morning. We'll just quit. Huh. Ah, the old put the batteries in backwards trick, eh? Hold on, hold on, hold on. That one goes there. But this one, it goes that way. Yeah, well, those weren't working together for good until I turned one of them around. There we go. So, yeah, I'm pretty much a techno wizard. I know the positive from the negative end of a battery. Um, so, what, what I want to do, though, is, is last week I, I turned older and um a number of you in a number of special ways encouraged me and and all of you by being in class encouraged me and i want to just say thank you and it's part of that i got an email this week now in legal circles i am listed if you go for example to our law firm website you'll find me listed as w mark lanier that's, that's the way I'm listed. There's a reason why. But I got an email this week, and I don't know if it's big enough for you to be able to read it, so I'll read it out loud. Um, Mark, your lesson today about names, uh, I guess watching on the Internet or something, your lesson today about names has called to my attention the fact that I do not know what your first name is. I've thought of some possibilities, such as William, Will, Wyatt, Weston, Wesley, Waylon, Walter, Warren, Wade, or perhaps Willy Wonka. Perhaps you prefer that your W name remains something known only by family and certain other confidants. If that is not the case, I would not object to being informed about this. Have a great day. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Okay, so today we're going to do three different things. <laughs> Today we're going to go three, down three different roads. The first one that we're going to do is we're going to ask what is in a name. And then the second thing we're going to do is look at the third commandment. Spoiler alert. I am convinced the third commandment is the most misunderstood of all ten. Just spoiler alert. And then after we do that and go down that path, we're going to ask the question, so what does that mean? What are the implications to me? How do I understand that and apply it? With me? All right, three ventures. Let's start. What is in a name? What is a name? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, the dictionary will often tell you something along the lines of a name is a word or a set of words by which a person, an animal, a place, a thing, a noun, is known, is addressed, or referred to. So, I am W. Mark Lanier. And I'll often go to legal events where there'll be name tags that say W. Mark Lanier. Now, when I got out of... Well, let's go back to my birth. I was there. It was a, quite an event. <laughs> um, when uh, uh, my dad was William Howard Lanier, and he had gone by Howard growing up, and he hated it. So when he went into the Navy, he decided to go by his first name, which is William, or Bill. And he was known as Bill Lanier all of my life. When I was born, they wanted me to have my dad's name. But my dad did not like his middle name, and my mom wasn't that big of a fan of it either. 
So instead of being William Howard Lanier next, they made me William Mark Lanier. Mark after the gospel writer, the second gospel. And so that was my name, but they did not call me William because they didn't want me confused with my dad. So I have always gone by my middle name, Mark, except when I had Miss Offensend in the fourth grade. And Miss Offensend in the fourth grade determined that my real name was William and I would be called William. I was not allowed to be called Mark. Well, being a fourth grader, I didn't pay that much attention to what she said when she said that. But three weeks or so into school, my mom got a call that uh, there needed to be a parent-teacher conference because I was the worst kid in the class. Mom said, not our son, that can't be. Oh, yes, he's so disrespectful, disobedient, won't do a thing I say. Etc. So mom goes up there and they have the parent teacher conference. Mom said, I, 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 Give me an example. And the teacher said, Well, I, today. I said, William, would you please come to my desk? And he totally ignored me. And mom said, You said what? I said, William, come to my desk. Mom said, Well, he's not William, he's Mark. No, his first name is William. Mom said, Well, you call him William. He won't come to your desk because he doesn't know you're talking to him. And I did, and I had no clue. She was, I thought we had some kid in class named William. You know, I mean, I'm, my name is Mark for those purposes. So this has been my life. I get to, out of law school, I go take a job here in Houston at a big law firm at the time, Fulbright and Jaworski, where everybody had a middle initial and all of their name plates and all of their law firm brochures and paraphernalia, you were expected to give your middle initial. Well, what am I going to do? Mark M. Lanier? No. So I instead, like several others at the law firm, used my first initial. So it's W. Mark Lanier, but I've always gone by Mark. Just stands for William. That's a label. Those are identifiers. That name is, is on my passport. It's on my social security card. It's on my driver's license. Those, those um, uh, name for us is a label. The thing is, we really have trouble translating the Bible word for word. I see David Cape seated out there. David's taught this class many times. David, wave your hand so they see you. David has a New Testament Bible translation entitled The Voice, The Voice. And he can tell you firsthand as someone who's taught Greek for dozens of years he can tell you how difficult it is to take one word that's in a different language that's thousands of years old and just turn it into a modern English word it's not easy to do so I don't want to ask you as much what is a name I want to ask you this question what is a shem what is a shem? See, uh, I'll put it into Hebrew because shem is a Hebrew word, if that helps you. What is a shem? I mean, it sounds like when you say, what is a shem? Gesundheit. You know, like you're sneezing. No. What is a shem? It's used 418 times, actually more than that. It's used in 418 verses. And it's almost always translated name. So when we see the word name in the Hebrew Old Testament, we're reading the Hebrew word Shem, and that's just the best the translators can do. But if you're reading some old piece of parchment and you come across Shem and you translate it name, that's okay because Shem can be a label or an identifier. An example of that is found in Genesis 2.19. This is just an identifier. It's, it's a label. It's talking about the location of the Garden of Eden. And it says, um, uh, 
da 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 Oh, actually, it does say it in the Garden of Eden, but 2.19 is a different one. Now, God, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, brought them to the man to see what he would call them, a label, an identifier. And whatever the man called, that was its shem. That was its label. That was its identifier. So that's a fair thing to do, to consider Shem a label or an identifier. But it's so much more than that. I've decided if I ever get to translate the Bible, many times I'm going to translate the word Shem differently. I'm going to translate the word Shem as resume. Think about your resume for a moment. And you'll come much closer to understanding the Hebrew word Shem. Here's an example. In a resume, one of the things you're going to have is your name. You're going to put your label on the resume. Shem. That's your name. Your label, W. Mark Lanier. But you're going to have a whole section of your resume where you put your experiences, your work history, what you've done. And Shem in the Hebrew includes your experiences, where you've been, what you've done. This is built into that word Shem. And so, for example, I've got three passages, but I could have put a legion of passages up here. I just grabbed three that were easy. You've got Genesis 10.25. Let's look at that together for a moment. Genesis 10.25. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, because in his day the earth was divided. Now, Peleg is the Hebrew word for divided. So if you're reading this in Hebrew, his name was Peleg, because in his days the earth was Pelegged. The earth was divided. That's the experience. And, and you see this over and over and over with names in Genesis. Genesis 16, 11. God's talking to Hagar, who's just so upset. And the Lord said to her, Behold, you're pregnant. You're going to bear a son. And you'll call his Shem Ishmael. You'll call his Shem Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Ishmael comes from the Hebrew word Shema. Ishmael. El is God. Ishma. God has listened to you. So you name him, God has listened. And that experience is in the name, in the Shem. It's not simply here's a label. It's the Shem needs to encapsulate the experience. Oh, look at Genesis 5.29. I skipped over this one, but it's a simple one. Genesis 5, there we go. Lamech has lived 182 years. He has a son, and he calls his name Noach, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one will bring us relief. Relief. Rest. Noach, not Shabbat, different word for rest. But this, is, this relief word is Noach. Going to name the kid Noah because through him God's going to bring us Noah. 
His name is part of the experience of his life. His Shem is part of his experience. And so when we see that word, Shem, we need to recognize as part of the resume, it's not just a label, but it can also be the experiences. You with me? Are you tracking with me? All right, because it's more than that. It's also your skills. You know how in your resume you'll list your skills? That's, in, that's inherent. That's, that's just a part of the idea of a Shem. Let's look at a couple of these. Genesis 4.21. We'll start with that one because I'm already in Genesis. Genesis 4.21. Let's see. Abel 4.21. Ah, here we go. A, um, Adab or Jabel, he was the Yabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Yubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. See that? Ubal is the word for a ram's horn coronet or pipe. So they named him Ubal, the pipe, because he's the father of everybody who played the pipe. That was his skill set. He was, he, was, he was like the Chuck Mangione of the ram's horn. Or whoever is Kenny G. Didn't, didn't he like some? Okay, this guy's like that's like naming Eric Clapton instead of naming him Eric Clapton. We would name him Guitar Man. Okay, I mean that's that's the idea here. You know Brent Johnson. You could name him Brent Johnson, or you could name him The Voice because he can sing. Who's your friend? <laughs> Who's your friend? Okay. Let me give you a couple others to show this skill set. Look at Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7, 14. This is a good one to show that name, Shem, includes your skill set. You'll know this verse. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Call his Shem Emmanuel. That wasn't the label of Jesus. Jesus didn't walk around and his mom and dad didn't name him Emmanuel. But his Shem, his skill set, who he was, the skills he brought to the table were God with us. See, and, and so I can remember as a kid thinking, well, boy, is the Bible true? Because this, this says he shall call his Shem Emmanuel. Because I was thinking name and label when I was a kid. And that wasn't the name and label of Jesus. But that's one of those translation problems. Shem is not just your name and your label it can be but it's more than that it includes your skill set it includes who you are you know look Isaiah says it again in verse 6 of chapter 9 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace that's what he brings to the table that's his skill set that's his character that's his power that's what he can do that's his shem that's his resume Look at the resume of Jesus. Look at the resume of God. If you look at the resume of Jesus, you're going to see on that resume, God with us. You're going to see on that resume, wonderful counselor. You're going to see on that resume, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. You'll see all of that. So your 
Shem, your resume, includes your skills, your experience. It also includes your references. And by references, I'm specifically meaning your reputation. Someone who can testify or something that can testify to how you do, how you perform. Genesis 12, 2 is a great example of this. We'll start there. Genesis 12, 2. Ah, got it. Sorry, don't mean to make y'all dizzy. The Lord, Yahweh, said to Abram. By the way, Abram means exalted father. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Your Shem great. God's not saying, so everyone will say, Abram, that's a great name. I like that name. He's saying, Abram, you, you as an individual, will have a great reputation. You will be known. Now, we still use name a little bit like that today. You want someone to come work on your house who has a good name. You want your children or your grandchildren to date someone with a good name. You know, it, name is, is, um, can reference your reputation. But it's, it's, it's not generally used that way. Shem, that was a direct use of it. You know, you look at Genesis 17, verse 5. God changes Abram's name, his label, his Shem. No longer shall your Shem be called exalted father, but your name shall be Avraham. Because I've made you the father of a multitude of nations. Avraham changes his name. Avram means exalted father. Avraham means father of a multitude. We got to change your Shem because your reputation is going to change. You're going to be so much more. Genesis 27:36. And I don't want to get bogged down. I just really want you to see. And I picked these from Genesis over and over for a very good reason. I'm using primarily Genesis. Esau is talking about his brother, Jacob. Isn't he rightly shemmed, Jacob? He's cheated me twice. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. Yaakov in Hebrew, Jacob. Means in an idiomatic sense, cheater. He says, well, his shem belongs on him. Cheater, he's cheated me twice. See, shem references your reputation. What you've done, your references. By the way, God changes cheater's name. In Genesis 32, when cheater has learned his lessons. And God wrestles with cheater at the fords of the Jabbok. And in 32 verse 28, God says, your name's no longer going to be called Cheater, but Israel, because you've striven with God and men and have prevailed. You've wrestled over this. Israel means someone who fights or strives with El, with God, Israel. Fights with God. I'm changing your name from cheater to fights with God because that's what you're going to be known as. That's your reputation. That's, that's the reference you need to have. So what's in a name? Maybe we do better asking what's in a shem. And it's your resume. It's who you are and it's what you've done. Now, let's look then with that depth of understanding 
at the third commandment. The third of the Ten Commandments says, You shall not take the Shem of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him who, guiltless who takes his Shem in vain. That word name there twice. We can stick the word resume in there. See, I grew up with the idea that this commandment saying, don't say God in a sentence or as an expression if you don't mean it. So you don't say, um, God, damn this, unless you're truly calling upon God to damn this. Damn being the last part of condemn. Or you don't just say God, oh my God, unless you truly mean it. So I was the smart alecky little kid who in third and fourth and fifth grade when kids would walk around and say, oh my God, I'd say, he's my God too. What? You should say our God because if we're going to talk about him, he's my God too. You're a nut. Uh-huh. I'll grow up and be a nut. I'm already a nut. But I mean, that's, that was, and don't get me wrong, you don't lightly say the name of God. But that's not the depths of this passage. That's not where this commandment has its keel. That's not the gravitas that keeps this ship upright. That's not what we've got here. This is the resume. Don't simply, don't take the name or the label of God in vain. But the experience that God has... Don't take that in vain. The skills that God has, don't take that in vain. What God has done, his references, his reputation, don't take that in vain. And now look at Exodus 3. Moses is on the side of Sinai and there's a bush that's being burned but not consuming. And God calls Moses out of the bush. And God says to Moses, and this is one reason that I put all those passages out of Genesis, and there are tons more than that where God says, or, or Genesis says, name him so-and-so because this happened. Named her this, Eve, because she's the mother of the, the mankind. And, and it, all of these names have that kind of meaning. That's the way they thought. That's the way things were. But then God calls Moses. Now Moses has been in Egypt for 40 years before he goes to the wilderness, has learned in Pharaoh's house all of these different gods. You've got Ptah, who is the god of, of, of uh, design. You've got, uh, you know, the, the god of uh, uh, Ra, the god of the sun. You know, you, you've got all these different gods that have all their little jurisdiction. And they've got all their little names. And Moses is there and he's talking to God through the bush. And Moses says, look, if I come to the people of Israel and I say the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they're going to say, well, what's his Shem? What's his deal? What's his resume? Is he God of the Sinai? God of the burning bush? What's his CV? What's his resume? What's his reputation? What's he done? What's his shtick? What, 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 that's what Moses is saying. You know, what, what, and then look at what God says. I am. This is powerful because there's a negative implication. I actually am. All those other gods they're naming, they're creatures of the imagination at best. At worst, they're demons. But 
I am. My resume, I really exist. I am real. And I am, or I will be, you can read it that way as well, what I will be. I am. Now you find any scenario, you find any location, you find any problem, I am. God is real. And so the real God is the one who's sending you. And my resume is going to unfold before your very eyes because the I am God is going to extend my arm and take you from the most powerful nation there is. You see the power in that? The power in the name? I am. Now, we're not supposed to take God's resume in vain. In vain? What's in vain? In vain, shav in the Hebrew is the word for vain. Shav, in vain. Shav can mean empty. As if something is empty. Don't take God's resume as if it's got nothing in it. As if it's worthless. As if it's ineffective. As if it's false. Don't take the resume of God as if it's false or fake or ineffective. Don't take who God is, what he's done, his experience, his skill set, his abilities. Don't take all of these things that in the law that reflect the character of God. Don't take these things as false. Don't take God's resume as false fake, phony, doctored up. Now here's the problem. By the way, shav, the Hebrew word translated in vain, don't take it in vain, is translated many times, multiple times in the Old Testament as false. Over and over and over, we'll read in Jeremiah, Shav as being false, inaccurate. That's the idea here. Don't, God has done amazing things. When God does something amazing for you and for me, and we don't give him credit, do you know we just took his name in vain? When we're encountering a difficulty or a problem and we don't think God's going to help us out or we worry that he won't, we are taking his reputation, his CV in vain as if it's ineffective. This commandment, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't take his Shem, his resume, as if it's empty, as if it's fake, as if it's doctored up. You know, you, you get a resume from someone and it says that they're fluent in Spanish. And they come in and talk to you and you say, Hola, como esta usted? And they say, I'm sorry, what? You say, well, your resume says that you're fluent in Spanish. Oh, well, I've forgotten a lot of that. So that's a doctored up resume. God didn't doctor up his resume for you. Don't assume that he did. Don't take God's resume as false. 
It's a reflection, the name of God. All of the law is a reflection of the character of God. But this commandment specifically is telling you, don't take the character of God lightly. So I want to go down the third road real quick because this is what's, this is the core of the message today. If you're tracking with me, here's where I want you to end. All of us in this life face difficulties. They come in different sizes. They come in different shapes. Some days we're better equipped to handle them. Some days we're not. Some days we're preoccupied enough to get them off our minds. Some days they weigh upon us very heavily. But it's the nature of life. We have and face struggle and difficulty. My, one of the first lawyers I worked for, uh, I was a law school at the time, we clerked for, I clerked for the city attorney of Lubbock, and uh, he turned, I don't know, some horribly high age that I've probably already passed, and he, um, the secretaries got him a t-shirt. It was a, a solid black t-shirt because he was all doom and gloom. That's just the way he was. So, so solid black with white letters that said, life is hard, dot, 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 and then you die. That was his t-shirt. Now, that's, I'm not in that camp. There's lots of joy. There's lots of excitement. There's lots of pleasure. There's so many good things God gives us in this life. But there are times that are hard for everybody. And I don't want to approach this life without God. And when I say I want God, I don't want 1% of God. I don't want 2%. This isn't milk. I want the whole God in my life. So I'm not going to treat his resume like it's bolstered or doctored up. I'm not going to treat him that way. Look at, passage, look at this psalm. Psalm 139.20. They speak against you, God, they speak against God with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. When we take the, the resume of God as if it's doctored up or false, as if he's not really as strong as we thought, he's not really as tuned in as we thought, he doesn't really love you as much as you thought. He's not as forgiving as we wanted him to be. When we, he's not, you know, you don't, you don't matter that much to him. He cares more about so-and-so than he does you. If we ever fall prey to that, we're walking in the same footsteps as God's enemies walk. And this, they speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. We could translate, your enemies take your resume as worthless. Well, they don't care what God's going to do to us. God schmod. That's what the enemies of God are doing. Let us see when we break that third commandment. We are manifesting an attitude that's more appropriate in the enemies of God who say, I'll do whatever I want to do. God doesn't matter to me. I'm not afraid of God. That that's, gives you the flavor of this commandment in another passage. Look at Isaiah 12, verse 4. You will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his resume 
make known his deeds among the peoples and proclaim that his resume is a phenomenal resume. Let me tell you how great the Lord is. Let me tell you what he has done for me. Let me tell you how I was in bad shape and he rescued me. Let me tell you how I was distracted and he brought me into attention. Let me tell you how I was wasteful and he taught me stewardship. Let me tell you how I wanted to live around me. And he taught me to live for others. Let me tell you how I was facing the difficulty. And he taught me to walk in faith of his solution. I was talking to several of our widows this morning because I was thinking about them as I was driving here and I was listening to a song by Amy Grant, If I Could See What the Angels See. And the song is just, if I could just get that glimpse of God in His presence, if I could hear the holy holies, how different would my life be? And it's got a line in there. I, if I could see what the angels see, I would see that death's goodbye is love's hello. We've got a God with a resume a mile long. And we should be telling the world about it, not just on Mission Sunday. When you leave a good tip for someone, you can put on there, God has blessed me. I hope with this, he blesses you. you. There are so many ways to show the greatness of our God, and that's what we need to do. Look at Isaiah 25, 1. Oh, Lord, you're my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your resume. I'm going to tell everybody what you've done. You've done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, sure. Do you see the depth of meaning of this passage when you understand Shem is his resume? It's not, oh Lord, you're my God, I'll exalt you, I will praise your name. I'll tell everybody, Yahweh is such a great name, such a wonderful label. No, I'm going to tell everybody, you are, you're real, you really exist. Look at what you've done. I'm going to tell everybody, God's done this and this and this and this. I'm going to tell them about your love and your compassion and your mercy, as well as your justice. I'm going to tell them who you are. I'm going to tell them what you've done. Wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. And God says, for, my, for the sake of my resume, I'm going to defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I'm going to restrain it for you and not cut you off. He's talking to disobedient people here. And he says, look, I've got, I got, I, this is going to be on my resume. For the sake of my resume, for my name's sake. By the way, when we pray in Jesus' name, we're praying based on his resume of what he did, not what we are and what we do. Lord, I do not come to you in the name of Mark Lanier. My resume sends me straight to hell. I come to you in Jesus' name. Onoma in the Greek is like Shem in the Hebrew. I come to you in Jesus' name because of who he is and what he did because of his resume. Because of his death and his resurrection. Isaiah 62, 2. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. That's who we are. Just like he changed cheater's name to strives with God. 
He will take your life. He will take your experiences. He will take who you are and what you've done and transform you. I loved hearing Don Fento. Our first Sunday back we had him here. He was my preacher in college. And I remember I, we, we brought him into the library to speak about how to age in the Lord. And one of the things he said is, is when you're young, which, you know, he's 90 when he's saying this, so I don't know, maybe that's middle age. But he said, when you're young, take care of your problems. Take care of your harshness. If you don't take care of your harshness when you're young and bring it to the Lord and let the Lord change who you are, you're going to turn into a harsh old man. If you find yourself addicted to pornography and you don't deal with that when you're young, you're going to find yourself a dirty old man. If you don't take care of, of your bitterness when you're young, you're going to find yourself a bitter old man. But God, when we come to him, God is able to transform us, give us a new resume. We don't have to walk around and say, yeah, here's my resume. Here, let me put my resume up here for you. Yeah, it's pretty empty. There's nothing on it. Or even worse, there's oops, smelly garbage. That's my resume. God says, no, no, no. You come to me. I'm going to give you a new resume. Someone asked me or made a reference to whether or not I preach against certain sins, one sin or another, whether it is, how it is, etc. And there are a number of things I don't address that much from this class. And the reason why is I want your heart right with God, and then God addresses those with you. That's God's going to, God's going to, you get your heart right with God. You seek the Lord with all of your might. Let him write your resume. He'll tell you what belongs on it and what doesn't. I love this. Look at Psalm 9.9. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your resume, God, people who know your resume, will put their trust in you. Because you've not forsaken those who seek you. God will answer when you cry to him. That's on his resume. And if you know his resume, you'll trust him to do that. So we end. Don't take the resume of the Lord your God as if it's fake, empty, void, meaningless. You can stand on his resume and proclaim it to the nations while he rewrites yours. Got it? That's class today. Father, would you bless us with a vision that emboldens us to not only trust you better, but turn to you more readily and more often and proclaim you to the nations for the greatness of who you are as you transform us into the image of your Son and write on our resume so fresh and new. That is our prayer through the resume and in the name of Jesus. Amen. See you guys next Sunday where we talk about the Sabbath.